Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Mary Ratcliffe with LOSN, and I wanted to um, let you know we are recording this meeting tonight, and that um, I'm with a. Sorry, I'm also doing the waiting room. I'll do that. You can talk. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Um, the uh, the Lake Oswego Sustainability Network is a community-based nonprofit organization run by volunteers with the purpose of promoting sustainability in Lake Oswego. The network includes businesses, community partnerships through individuals and nonprofit organizations, faith communities, educational institutions, and government entities, all committed to creating a community, community that values environmental quality, social equity, and economic vitality. We hold events, engage the community through outreach and have multiple action teams. Some of our teams are a schools team, an interfaith team, a climate team, and a natural resources team. We work with partners um, throughout the city on projects to incre um, increase clean energy, reduce waste and toxics, promote clean water and air, reduce climate emissions and more. We help educate our community through our newsletters and forums on sustainability topics such as sustainable building principles, affordable housing, soil health, alternative um, renewable energy, and so on. We nurture a sustainable community through our annual celebration event, community discussion groups, regular faith-based get-togethers, monthly social hours, and much more. We have a team working to promote a sustainable approach to the wastewater um, treatment plant. We have chosen to work on this because a new plant will last for 40 to 50 years. Um, and a wastewater treatment is usually the largest user of energy in the city. This is a collective issue where we can really make a difference. Now, let me turn this program over to Jay Hamachek, who will be our forum facilitator and is a member of the Lake Oswego Sustainability Advisory Board. Thank you, Chad. Hi there, Jay Hamachek. And uh, tonight I'm going to be kind of have two tasks. One, I'm going to be kind of queuing this up and talking about how sustainability and wastewater treatment uh, align. Um, I'll also be helping moderate uh, tonight's meeting. And we've got a lot of great speakers. Um, and one thing I just want to point out that we've got a number of people here from Lake Oswego and their engineering company. They're very early in the process of replacing the wastewater treatment plant. And they have many more questions than they do answers today. <clears throat> and we'll see more answers coming this fall. So, you know, please, uh, when, you, when you have questions for them, they can talk about the process they're going through in the timeline, but you know, the good answer is uh, stay tuned to the channel. Uh, the meeting, we've got a tight timeline tonight. And so I'll be popping in every once in a while, reminding the speaker they're coming up on two minutes, one minute type of thing. We want your questions. And so please use your chat tab in my screen right here. It's showing the top of the screen, yours, it may be the bottom, but hit that, put in your questions after each presentation we will have a two minute Q and A session at the end. If we, and I'll read your questions to the speaker. If we run out of time at the very end of this present, the whole presentation, there is more time for questions and answers. Now, why we're kind of talking about this, I and mean, the Willamette River is a great example and it's, typical of any river in the US that back in the early 1900s, the river was an open sewer and a uh, river that you wouldn't want to go swimming in or you know if you had a water ski boat back then, which you wouldn't have, but you wouldn't take it on the river. <clears throat> Shortly after World War II, the Clean Water Act came into being and this started the process of cleaning it up. And, but in 1962, a reporter named Tom McCall uh, produced a show called Produce Pollution in Paradise, which was pretty embarrassing view of the river still was an open sewer. It outraged the uh, citizens of Oregon and started the process. And also Tom became governor really because of this issue. And uh, so Oregon started really taking a look at it, but it wasn't until 1972 EPAs formed and the Clean Water Act was amended. And so when you look at uh, treatment plants such as the Tryon Creek plant uh, or any pretty much any plant in the US, they date back 40 to 50 years back to the 70s and uh, the Clean Water Act Amendment. Now, I'm not gonna read off the rest of them, but the river dramatically cleaned up, but still has a number of environmental issues. And to meet that, we really kind of have to look back and my, my apologies to the wastewater engineers that could be talking later on. 
I'm going to vastly over, oversimplify the wastewater process. And uh, uh, so when Patty comes behind me, she can give you a little more details. But the city of Portland built the Trine Creek plant and still operate it today. And look at the in, inflow to the uh, plant, municipal, or not municipal, but the citizens going in, uh, uh, commercial and industrial, designed a wastewater treatment plant to meet the clean water requirements or the NPDES permit, which is National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, otherwise known as NPDES, which regulates uh, wastewater going to the river and stormwater. So the plant was an aerobic plant, and you'll be hearing uh, there, there is a, uh, a typical plant in the US. Um, outflows we go to the river, the biosolids are trucked by the city of Portland. You might see the nice stain, shiny stainless steel tankers leaving every day to go to their biosolid uh, disposal plant in North Portland. Now we fast forward to today. And why this is important is, as you, you're starting to hear, the river still has environmental issues in it. Um, the NPDES permit, the EPA has inc increased the permit requirements to the point where the existing plant, not just Lake Oswego's or the Lake Oswego Tri and Creek plant, but any plant in the U.S. has trouble complying with the new regulations to the point where the Tri and uh, Creek plant would have take a massive amount of capital and bring it up to today's standards. And it's just not today you have to worry about. We have to worry about the future because these plants, as you heard, will be here 40, 50 years. And so we have to design a plant that has the flexibility to change. Because if we don't, off to this side, the Clean Water Act has a little proviso called the uh, citizen suit built into it. And it allows non-government organizations, and in this area, one of the most active would be the Columbia River Keepers, who file lawsuits against municipalities, industrial, and also against the regulators like DEQ for failing to follow the, uh, the NPDES requirements. And these suits, besides being embarrassing, now are settling 20, 30, 50 million dollar plus. And so whether you're an industry or a city, you don't want to get anywhere near that. Um, also, we have to look at highest and best use to land. Um, a lot of wastewater plants, not necessarily the Tryon one, were built in next to low income um, uh, residents in the uh, down near the river areas, because that's where you have to have the plant to get good flow into the river. So it raises the whole environmental social governance that was built next to a population that didn't have the economic or uh, political capital to have input into the plants. Also being the river, these plants, we want to make sure they're above the floodplain. And as we look at the weather, it's cooled down now to 103. It's a little bit different than when we all grew up. Foothills was lucky, it was built into an industrial, like, like, uh, industrial commercial area. Um, but it's an area, there's a foothills redevelopment plant already part of the city. Um, and the long-term goal is to redevelop it to be a nice urban core. Uh, to do that, uh, any of these aerobic plants uh, have a slight odor. And to the wastewater engineers, it's probably a pleasant odor. But to the rest of us, I don't think we'd want our open window by it. Um, and plants like the Tryon plant uh, occupy a lot of footprint. And it's a footprint right next to the river, high value if you're going to redevelop. So the goal is to allow urban re redevelopment in the future by moving the plant to a little bit higher, to make sure it's not in the flood zone, make sure there's no odor, and a much smaller footprint. Now, cost of service. So if you haven't done it, I want you to, when you, when you finish this meeting, get your latest water bill, oh, flip it. it over backwards, and look at your variable costs, i.e. your water use. Extremely small portion of that water bill. Most of it goes into servicing the uh, debt of the new floating interceptor line, like in Oswego Lake, the water plant, uh, the whole sewer system. And so for uh, municipalities like Lake Oswego, funding these plants are important because if you're low income, or um, low income or fixed income, even a $10 rate increase can be traumatic for you. And for the commercial industrial users, often they will not place a new plant or move out if the rate structures are too high. Now, when we look at the climate change, which really gets into a lot of the heart, everybody's hearts here, um, as you heard, these plants are typically one of the largest electrical users in the uh, in, this, in the municipality they're in, they take a mass amount of electricity to get the aeration, the air going through this through the sludge. That that is what we call scope two uh, uh, carbon. Um, it's something we have we have to look at when we're designing a new plant. Can we design a plant that uses less electricity, i.e., has less carbon footprint? And if you haven't guessed, oh, temperatures back up 104. We have less snow. 
out there and uh, poor Mount Hood's looking a little peaked right now. We're seeing reduced water flow. And if any of us have driven by Detroit Reservoir, you can say that it really looks that way. O Oregon's about 10 years behind California, Arizona, where reclaimed water out of the wastewater plants is used for irrigation and, and watering, golf courses, parks, things like that. It's something that's just kind of coming into its own in Oregon and it'll take some more lodge changes. But the plant itself also has a carbon footprint. And so these plants use biologic process, which uh, off gas methane or CH4. Methane has a carbon equivalency of 21. And so for every ton, ton of methane that's discharged, the equivalent of 21 tons of carbon dioxide there. And so these new plants also have to look at how do they, can they capture that uh, methane? If they can, can they convert it to carbon dioxide? You do that by burning it through a generator or a combined heat cycle. Combined heat cycles are kind of you know, a neat, neat technology that you get waste heat out of it that you can reuse. You generate electricity for use in the plant. Any surplus you can sell to the grid. And you also harvest 20 carbon credits for every uh, ton of methane that's burned. So there's some potential economic um, streams coming in. So that's just kind of the high thing, why we're talking about this. There's a lot of opportunity, a lot of pitfalls that any municipality has to look at when they're designing a plant. And uh, so with that, are there any questions out there? As I stop this and get back to the chat. All right. Don't have any questions there. Going once, twice. Sold. So now I get to introduce Patty Nelson, uh, and uh, who's going to give us a, a, a overview of the technology. Uh, Patty was with the uh, City of Portland for a few years, uh, retired from the City of Portland, is doing now consulting for the City of Oregon City. And uh, so, Patty, get you unmuted there, or you got to unmute and then it. Yep, yep, yep. Just there you go. Get set up there. All right. I can I can play this out loud if you're interested. <laughs> okay. Thank you for inviting me. I just want the audience to know that although I spent the majority of my career in wastewater, um, just a portion of it was for treatment. So there's certainly experts here that can probably go into more depth with wastewater treatment. But I was asked to kind of give an overview, some basics. So some of this is pretty basic. <clears throat> I thought this would be a fun slide. So if we are talking about poo, like poo, not Winnie the poo. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about wastewater treatment 101 and actually Jay covered a lot of it um, and opportunities for sustainability and some case studies. So my girls, the four things, they grew up with a sewer engineer. And so um, my daughter definitely read the book, Everyone Poops. So she learned very early how, where poop goes. In fact, that was her first science project in kindergarten, and she got to go down to the wastewater treatment plant. The highlight of her life, I'm sure. Um, I like to put this in for, for folks when I'm talking to them about wastewater. A lot of people know about septic systems. And so I think it's a really good illustration of kind of basic wastewater treatment. You know, It collects the poo. The bugs, you know, work on you know, chewing up all of the solids. We won't talk about what exactly those solids are. Um, and then there's, there's water that you know, comes from that and it goes to a drain field. And basically it's working on an anaerobic process. So those bugs are eating away and decomposing our poo. So something that I think most people know is, you know, most cities are developed around water. Water is integral to our lives. So uh, most communities are settled right next to a river because they need it for drinking. But as, you know, health issues rose and they figured out that poop was causing a lot of health issues, right? They would collect it and discharge it to the river. And I remember when I started at the city of Portland, um, they showed us a picture of the Willamette River. I wish I could not find it. Um, but, you know, that was our first sewer system. So um, that was number one. And then they went to plan B. And I think Jay had highlighted that that was like in the, you know, 40s and 50s, they started building what they called interceptor sewers. So they'd run along the rivers and they would intercept the, the sewage and then take it to a treatment plan. That was the first idea that they had. So I love this picture. 
it's a picture of um, citizens and, and students that were protesting, you know, back in 1938 at the um, city of Portland City Hall. And they were protesting because they wanted their rivers back. They wanted to be able to swim. The river was banned from swimming. Uh, it was highly polluted. And that's really that demand where it really treated, you know, pushed us to treating the sewage. So I put this in just as a, a quick reminder, you know, early on our focus was clean rivers, right? We want clean rivers for recreation. We want clean rivers um, for our health, for a number of reasons. And so treatment plants were designed to do their job, but there wasn't a lot of focus about the environment. Um, there wasn't a lot of focus about society. I think Jay highlighted that too. You know, you put the treatment plant closest to the river, you're not really taking into account, you know, who's living there. It's more of a, those darn engineers, right? <laughs> Putting at the low point. Or, or the economy. So, you know, they got the treatment plants in, you'll see them all next to the river, Columbia um, Boulevard treatment plants right next to Columbia and the SLU. You've got the Tryon treatment plant, which actually I worked on the outfall. Right? So it's a beautiful outfall to the Willamette River. <laughs> um, but again, and then, and then over time standards change. And Jay had a great slide about, you know, kind of the, the chronology, but as we learn more about what we do impacts the environment, regulations change. Um, people start speaking up and wanting change. So, you know, I worked 10 years on our combined sewer um, program at City of Portland. So that's another example. I remember people when we go out and talk to them, they'd say, why didn't you build it right the first time? Well, the city did. They, they built it to meet the standards of the time, but the standards of the time allowed when there's big, huge rainstorms and all of that water's combined to overflow into the river. And so this, we know, right, that's not healthy. And so the standards were increased and a number of cities were under mandates, under you know, uh, court orders to correct that problem. And so that was why we built that larger, it's a larger um, interceptor sewer, tunnel, a tunnel to collect more and take it to the plant. The other change over time is that um, treatment plants were designed with just what they call primary treatment. So think about it like a septic tank. It's just, it's just collecting the solids um, and letting it decompose and then letting that water go into the river. Usually it's a river. And then they're hauling off those solids. But again, the water quality isn't that great. So then the standards increased. And so they put in what's called secondary treatment. So that's kind of they call it polishing. It's not really polishing, but it cleans it better. And supposedly you can drink from uh, the effluent, but I've never tried it. <laughs> you could go for it if you'd like, but I'm not. But now really the focus, we're learning more and more, just like you know, we're talking about today. Look at how hot it is, right? Things are changing. And what can we do? So now moving forward, there's a big push as, as we go and we start replacing our systems and upgrading our treatment plants to step back and look beyond clean rivers. Water is a huge resource. Um, I think it's our most valuable resource. And it's something that I think will be the biggest issue in years to come with climate change. So it's no longer about just getting rid of the wastewater, which um, you'll see a number of treatment plants that are actually changing their name. I put a few examples here. Some are changing it to water resource recovery, right? Some are looking at water reclamation plants. And again, it's getting away from that idea that the water that comes through with the solids is waste because the idea is that every drop of water has value. And, and I think that's an important point. And that gets back to that triple bottom line, right? Looking at the environment, the society and the economy. So they asked me to put together a few case studies. I, I'm not an expert on these, but I know a little bit about them. So I'll talk as much as I can. The city of Portland probably I know the most about. Um, and I tried to find information on this. When I first started with the city, a lot of years ago, we won't ask how many, <laughs> um, we had a composting. So I remember they tried composting at the wastewater treatment. And you know, with those solids, hauling them off, finding a place to haul them, um, there's not only an expense in terms of hauling as well as, well as you, know, you have more trucks going through, um, but then finding a place to haul it. So I think they tried composting for a while with yard, mixing with yard debris and whatnot. And I know that that was land intensive and was not something that they continue with. So before I left, they were working on um, this program where they were taking 
methane that's burned off at treatment plants, you'll see flames, you know, that are being burned off. They're just burning it off. And instead of doing that, they're trying to reclaim it and to actually uh, use it as a resource and set it up so that we could have, we were setting up where we are, tr our um, trucks could refuel using, using the fuel. And I'm not sure, I tried to get an update on where they're at, but I think they were trying to work with, um, I don't know if it's TriMet or some other agencies to have, you know, providers, right? People that are actually teaming up with the city, coming to the treatment plant and refueling and using the waste, you know, so it's 100% waste recovery of the methane. So I don't have any other stats in these, and this was the press release from 2017, so. And then Gresham, I, I thought this was really impressive. Um, they call it energy net zero. Um, and from what I read, and I didn't have a chance to talk to Steve Fancher, he's the environmental director out there, but they, they actually take the fats and grease um, from like restaurants. People, restaurants usually have like a septic tank that's collecting the fats and the grease and they'll have to have those hauled off. So instead of having those hauled off, they're bringing them to the treatment plant and they're using it to feed the bugs right, to help in the process. So that helps with energy. Um, but then they also put in solar panels. So the solar panels that are out there are also helping to, you know, use as energy supply for the treatment plant. And I think Jade mentioned, you know, treatment plants use a lot of energy. So I thought that was a creative solution. And that's why they call it a net zero. And I, oh, I forgot my, I forgot my question slide, Jay. <laughs> so I would take questions at this point. Don't see any questions popping up yet. So they, they all want to hear about the real treatment plant, the treatment they plant. Do. So we can have to stop <laughs> petting his cat there and uh, okay. have a good question. But, you know, as, as the, um, you know, when I look, you know, listening to that with, you know, reclaiming the methane, to, you know, power vehicles. Um, the other thing, you know, just struck me that, you know, we used to say that anything less than a meter of water would be considered a drought here in Oregon. And we re really haven't had a substantial rainfall for, what, 70 days now. And growing up here, we also always used to see, you know, you'd laugh. Summer would start July 5th, the day after uh, 4th of July, and totally different weather patterns, things like that. And so it'd be interesting to see how the, the reclaimed water use uh, uh, develops for the area. And uh, uh, just like we've seen in the you know, more arid areas like California and Arizona. So, all right. Um, oh, Jake, one thing I just want to plug in is um, just because you brought it up is that um, when I was at the Portland, there was an effort. So Lloyd, the Lloyd district is actually an eco district mm -hmm. and they were really trying to pursue um, purple pipe and, um, you know, reuse. And, and that has its challenges in terms of, you know, how do you fit everything in the right away? Right. And it's a oh, yeah. huge infrastructure cost, but what they did do is um, they call them mega block development. So within this big, huge block development, Mm -hmm. They actually set up a sustainable system, right, where they have actually gray water and reuse in, in the building. Same thing with the um, Port of Portland offices out at the airport. I don't know if people know, but they have their own living machine, their wastewater treatment plant at the first floor of the office building. So those are just a few examples of some, some, some sustainability approaches. Yeah, and for everybody on the call, the purple pipe is kind of industry slang and the, the pipe is purple, the sprinkler heads are purple to signify it's reclaimed water and you may not want to take a drink out of that pipe um, on that. So our, our next speaker, uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Anthony Hooper, Hooper, the deputy uh, city manager, uh, Katie Kirkland, uh, city information person and Lee Ward from uh, EPCOR. Um, and a few other supporting uh, Jamie uh, or Jill in there um really to cover the, <clears throat> the the challenge that they have to take an old city of portland wastewater plant and modernize it or move it um and i've really got to compliment anthony who has been very open and, and involving uh pesky people like ourselves in the process and we do appreciate it 
And as I said, he'll have more questions and answers tonight, but it's really the start of the journey. So uh, with that, uh, we can turn this over to Anthony. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for the welcome. And I, I just want to say I've been very impressed with uh, with you and uh, and Elisa and, and Mary. And uh, I just appreciate your passion, truly. So uh, I want to talk before I start. I just I want to uh, talk about my, my team a little bit. Uh, first, I'll talk about Jill Jamison. Um, so she um, is a person that uh, Congress actually calls in to talk about P3s when it comes to wastewater treatment. And uh, and so she is one of the foremost experts in, in the US when it comes to public private partnerships and wastewater treatment. And then also have uh, Lee Ward uh, and he uh, uh, works for EPCOR and we're very lucky to have him as a partner with us on this project. Uh, he'll talk a bit about EPCOR and about his credentials and also about uh, projects they've done. They've done quite a few throughout um, throughout Canada and the US. And then uh, and then uh, lucky to have uh, kind of my partner in crime on this project which is Katie uh, who uh, works on the Boone's Fire Road project, also worked on the um, uh, L uh, Tiger Partnership Project, and uh, has has a uh, she's very good with public outreach, and she'll talk about what we're planning to do in the future. And there, there's a lot. There's about 11 months left on this project till we get to the point where we're going to ask council to uh, approve to move to the pre-construction phase. And at that point, we'll be about 60% design completed, and we'll have cost estimates, and um, and uh, we'll we'll have a pretty good idea about uh, kind of. Um, the project as a whole, have enough information for the council to decide whether or not we're going to start moving towards building it. So I thought it would be helpful for me to, um, and then finally, I'll talk about myself just briefly, which is I've been in the city for 11 years. Um, I'm the deputy city manager and uh, formerly a public works director as well. I have transitioned from being a public works director to working on this project uh, uh, more full time, also doing a very variety of other things for the uh, city manager as well uh, with for the city manager's office. Uh, but very lucky to be working on this project and, and um, uh, it's actually going extremely well. So let me, let me talk about those things and uh, we'll be happy after we're done presenting, uh, all, all of us are going to present to answer any questions that you have, and we'll, we'll do our very best. Um, okay, so uh, let me go ahead and share my screen, and uh, we'll, I'll kind of walk you through, uh, through a few things. All right. All right, so let's go ahead and start the slideshow. Okay, so um so this the first one is of the trying creek plant so this was built in 1965 it was expanded in about 1974 and uh so the city of portland was planning on doing a bunch of upgrades and the upgrades were in the vicinity of about 130 million dollars worth of upgrades in the near term in the next 10 years and they needed to do these upgrades in order to meet DEQ requirements uh, they have um, a permit uh, that is currently um, uh, um, an administrative um, extension, uh, and I'll show a slide of that one in a little bit. It's been out of uh, out of been an administrative extension since 1999. Uh, let's see, make sure that's correct. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, 2009. 2009. So uh, that's when it was um, uh, the permit um, expired, and we've been an administrative uh, uh, extension since then. And so. Anthony, yes. sorry to interrupt. Um, I think this the you can see the notes on the on the presentation screen. You just got to change, switch the display. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay. Great. Okay, uh, so that's the next slide. I'll, I'll it's giving a preview of that one. Um, so, um, so, so here's here's what we were, we're trying to figure out. So, in about 2017, um, so, um, the question was asked of Does it make sense to invest in an old plant that was built in 1965 that cost about $130 million worth of near term um, investments, plus a lot of money over the over the next, you know, 30 years in addition to that, or does it make sense to build new? And so um, uh, we were approached by um, a team um, uh, yeah, that uh, public prior partnership team I started and we actually commissioned a feasibility study to look into it. And what it came back and said is, yeah, I think it's going to be more cost effective to build a new one. Plus, it's probably cheaper in the long run as well. So and actually, as we're digging into this, we're finding that I think that's absolutely true. Um, but there's still work to do to confirm that. Uh, so so basically what the what we decided to do 
in December of 2018 was the council uh, uh, authorized us to move forward with a public private partnership project uh, and uh, to procure a company to work with us to deliver a, a um, potentially design, build, finance, operate, and maintain a brand new plant uh, somewhere in the Foothills area um, adjacent to the existing plant. So this existing plant is, is owned and operated currently by the city of Portland. Uh, with the with how we're proposing this new plant, uh, it would actually be um, owned and operated by the city of Lake Oswego, and then um, operated and maintained and built um, by EPCOR, uh, and EPCOR is our public private partner. And uh, so, uh, essentially, how this this whole structure is set up is that um, there is so. Um, the choice is going to be either to build new or build existing. We have to do one or the other. We can't just not do anything because, once again, we're out of uh, DEC requirements. There has to be a major investment in the old plant or build a new one. Uh, what we found is that actually through how we have the financing set up through our, our private entity, EPCOR, is that um, they're willing to actually float quite a bit of money up front on this project where we would be unable to do that ourselves publicly. Um, and we, it would, there would be a pretty... Uh, decent rate impacts if we were to do this project on our own, but because of how the, the flexibility of private money and uh, um, how this is structured, um, uh, we we can do it without without uh, raising rates more than what it would be through the existing option. And the existing option, the rates were projecting to be 3.9% per year, so that's the equivalent of about three dollars per year. Uh, the um, uh, per uh, three dollars per month per customer, um, and what that what that it basically, um, the three percent was is pretty much what we have for all of our rates. It's just the baseline uh, to 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 deal with inflation. So it's about 0.9 percent more, a little bit less than one percent more of what we're projecting for, in order to do either option, the existing option or to build new. However, uh, we think that it, it's going to be more cost effective in the long run to build new. Um, but the rates, at least in the in the near future, will are are projected to be exactly the same no matter what option we go with. So um, with this agreement, um, uh, EPCOR would be uh, would operate maintain for about 30 years, and then we transfer ownership from Portland to Lake Oswego. And another part of our deal is that with our inter interim intergovernmental agreement with the city of Portland is that um, they would sell the property to us for a dollar, and then um, but we would need to demolish the old plant and remediate soil. And actually, before we move on to, to doing that, we're asking EPCOR to price all that out to figure out what the, um, the cost of demo and also what the cost to remediate um, that land next to it. So um, I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what where we're talking. So once again, this is the Foothills area, and right next next to the plant, uh, we have three uh, properties that we're kind of bundling together. We've already done some environmental studies on these properties. I uh, completed that um, in the last uh, month or, or so ago, and uh, it's looking like uh, this uh, is. It, and we also did some geotechnical work on it too. It's looking like it's, it's possible for the site to work for us. So um, essentially it's about 5.9 acres. Now, the this is the biggest constraint with our project is, is the, the amount of land that's available for us to build on. And so the existing plant is about uh, 12, 13 acres and they need to expand to 14 acres in order to do the upgrades. So we're, we're cutting the footprint in half. And we're able to do that because of the technologies uh, have become, um, there's there's one Aquan Rada that, that we're planning on, on using and that uh, Lee's gonna talk about a little bit more in detail later um, that allows for uh, the footprint to be cut in half, basically. Is this way more compact uh, The and and the process is, is very, very efficient. And also there's there's a tremendous energy savings too compared to traditional uh, that Ili will go over as well. It's very energy efficient. Uh, okay. So I talked already about how the permit has been expired since 2009 and that uh, that's, that's a driving factor for this project that we have to do something um, in order for future permitting um, compliance and also to future proof too. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to uh, Jill to kind of talk about the project timeline at this point. So, Jill. Sure. Um, thank you, Anthony. Um, yeah, so this is a, a graphic that really kind of explains the process. To, to Anthony's point, um, and just to reiterate, um, th this is not a greenfield project. And by that, I mean, we're not starting from scratch, right? We're, we're looking to either 
well, we're looking to replace the existing Tryon Creek and it's only gonna move forward if the project meets certain preconditions. And some of those preconditions are that it has to be on a life cycle basis equal to or less expensive than the alternative option, right? Um, I, I, I tend to think that investing in Jurassic technology and looking backwards is never a good way to go forward. There are reliability issues with the existing plant. You can kind of paste it together and, and with, with, with gum and, and, and tape, um, but it may not be as reliable going forward. One thing that Anthony didn't mention, which I think is also hugely important for you guys from a sustainability perspective, is that the current plant sits in a floodplain and it's been known to flood, right? And so part of this project, if it's to move forward, is also gonna address some of the resilience issues, not only in terms of climate change and flooding, but also in terms of cybersecurity and those things that in 1965, nobody was really thinking about, right? So we're looking for a more energy efficient plant, a more efficient plant, one that comes in at a lower life cycle cost than the upgrade to the existing plant, et cetera. But those are a lot of things you need to know before you pull the trigger on the contract. And so the way that this entire construct was put together, Anthony mentioned that there was a competitive procurement. It was international. You guys had groups from literally all over the globe that were interested in this project. Um, and it was awarded to EPCOR, um, which is a, a company who I know from other projects projects across the United States and the globe. So we're in good hands with them. Um, the way this works is we call it a progressive process. So the first stage is this, that if you look at this graphic, we've gone through the procurement process. So we're in the preliminary services agreement. During that preliminary services agreement, this is where we're gonna be doing design development, cost estimating, putting together the financing package, putting together you know, definitive um, um, scheduling and those sorts of things. But most importantly, perhaps we're dealing with DEQ. So we're getting the permits um, that need to be in place to be able to move forward with this. Um, because it's a zombie permit that you currently hold, or this, that's, the zombie permit is that term for those that have expired, but EPA requires them to be renewed every five years. There's a huge backlog in Oregon, and so there's a court order that's actually saying you need to move forward and start issuing these new permits. We think it would take much longer, significantly longer with, with the Tryon Creek plant because we need to figure out how to upgrade that facility to meet the current regulations. With this though, we do have to go through an entirely new permitting process and that takes some time. So there are multiple things happening here, cost development, permitting, schedule development, financial structuring, all of those good things. But when you see the, uh, you'll see where we are right now. We're just about to get a basis of design report. And that's about a 15% design level. So it's very early in the process. Cost estimates have huge contingencies in them. Um, we're looking at all kinds of sustainability issues. Some of the things that we're hoping to be able to do with this project is, is be able to reuse the water. I think um, Jay talked about um, reclaimed water. So water reclamation, being able to at least use it in terms of irrigation on the site. Um, we're looking at energy efficiencies. Um, the technology that, that, that's been chosen has a 50% savings, so it's a lower climate impact and, and those sorts of things. But all of these things still need to be developed. But there'll be check-in points at the basis of design next month. Then there's going to be a 30% design. These presentations will go to the council, so you'll have an opportunity to hear the public presentation on that. But also, as Katie's going to talk about in a minute, there's a lot of public outreach so that you guys can get your ideas if there's something you like or don't like. You'll have an opportunity to feedback on that. Then there'll be a 60% design level, which is which, at what point you pretty much have very good pricing. We know what the guaranteed price will be. Council can then make a, a, a well-informed decision. Do we go forward with this or do we invest back in, into Tryon Creek? Um, and at that point, you either go or you don't go with the project. And that's where we have the big red circle, which is approve the project agreement. Our, our guts are telling us that it's gonna be cheaper to do the new plant, a state-of-the-art new plant, than to try to upgrade the other. And then you move into the design and construction phase followed by the operating phase. Um, in, in this case as well, and I do think it, it's important to note, um, because you've contracted with EPCOR, so, so the, the facility is going to be owned by the city of Lake Oswego. It's, it's, a, it's a public asset, but it's just being financed and delivered with the help of EPCOR, um, and they're going to operate it over the term. So if they're not operating at the standards that are prescribed, you don't actually have to pay them the full amount that they're due, right? So they're incentivized through this, through this structure to make sure this works. And as you guys know, 
uh, in the United States, we have a, a national pastime, which is called deferring maintenance. <laughs> um, and so, so we generally kick the can down the road and we, we don't have budget to do everything. Under this, this agreement structure, EPCOR is obligated contractually to do so. And so we're locking in the life, life cycle um, asset management of this project. So um, I don't know, Anthony, is there anything else you need me to talk about? Or if we're going to pass it over to Katie, who's going to talk a little bit, I think, about the, the outreach process. I did see one question there. Do you want to get that question first? Sure. Uh, sure. Second. What's your bill? I don't know if we want to just jump into that. So somebody asked a question, will the infrastructure bill, if it ever gets passed, will that um, have funding for um, wastewater treatment plants? So, so in the United States, we very rarely get federal grants for wastewater. Um, there are a lot of loan programs, so you'll see them through the SRF funds. But I think it is important to note that um, in partnership, uh, the city and EPCOR actually have already applied for a, what we call a WIFI loan, which is a treasury rate loan, so lower than the borrowing power right now of Lake Oswego, um, to uh, get a long-term 30 five year loan um, to be able to help finance this project. That's gonna lower the life cycle costs on this as well. You would not have been able to do this, in my opinion anyway, if you would, if you go with the, um, the Tryon Creek upgrade. The reason for that is because some of the scoring criteria, how they decide who they're gonna give these loans to, because it's a very competitive national process, has to do with, are you using new technologies? Are you making investments into resilient infrastructure, which in this case, there have to be levies and things like that to protect the, the, the assets. Cybersecurity is another one. Um, so we check all the boxes <laughs> with this process to hopefully score well so that uh, your project will get the most beneficial use of federal funds. And that is part of the infrastructure package they're expanding with you program. So. I'll stop there and pass and, it. And I'll, I'll just add there that um, we estimate that the amount of savings uh, on uh, what we pay out for finance costs is somewhere in the vicinity of $30 million. So very significant to the, the overall project. And uh, yeah, let's, let's pass the Katie. And then uh, there's actually another question, but I think Lee's going to actually talk about um, uh, all the different elements, including flood um, mitigation as part of his, pro his presentation. And then at the end, um, I think uh, there's a lot more that we can talk about, but uh, I think let's, let's, uh, let's keep, keep moving. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Joe. Anthony, can you move on to the next slide? I think the final slide, thanks. Um, Okay, so um, as Jill kind of touched on, we're really in the early stages here. Um, so right now we're in the process of developing a public involvement um, and communication strategy for the project. Um, and as, as Anthony touched on some of the project constraints that we have with the site, um, and obviously when Lee's gonna start talking soon about the technology that's been selected. So, so that's a decision that's already been made um, but our goal is really to create appropriate and, and meaningful opportunities for input, like um, hosting some information sessions, some uh, neighborhood meetings, public meetings, and online um, open houses uh, to match up with some of the key design milestones that Jill mentioned during uh, when she went through the slide with the, with the schedule. Um, and so this way we can really learn from stakeholders in the community. We can seek input um, and resolve issues and also share information at key, key milestones. Um, presenting and attending meetings uh, with key stakeholder groups like um, the Sustainability Network tonight and um, our Sustainability Advisory Board is also going to be a key element of that plan. So at, at this stage, our first formal outreach opportunity that we are planning on holding is a community information session in October um, to share some robust information about the project and really kick off our outreach efforts. Um, and then we will also be holding um, some information sessions and open houses at, at key points during the design um, when we're at 30%, 60% design uh, to get feedback as well. Um, we have also developed a, a, a basic like a project identity brand, um, which will be used on all our project materials and communications efforts. That's this um, <laughs> Lego wastewater treatment facility logo that we have here. Uh, and right now I'm also working with our IT department to create a new, uh, a new website, a new project website, which will have a lot of information um, on there. And then uh, hopefully we'll have that launched and available 
um, by the end of this month or in early early September. And that will also include an opportunity for people to register for, for e-news that we have and updates we place on the on the website and, and house a lot of information um, on the project there. So we're in that early stage of really developing sort of some of the FAQs and key information, key facts and, and uh, messaging. So, um, but uh, yeah, we really welcome all your feedback and participation and we really look forward to working with all of you. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Lee from Apple to outline the technology um, that they've been selected. Great, thanks a lot, Katie. Um, I feel like um, that half of my presentation has already been talked about. <laughs> Oops, we don't want that, we want this. All right, so um, I guess, First of all, um, you know, it was mentioned that uh, we did go through a, the city of Lake Oswego went through a procurement process um, to choose a partner. And uh, we feel very fortunate that we were chosen as that partner. Um, so who the heck is EPCOR and, and uh, what are we all about? Um, we are about 125 years old. Um, we currently have about 3,600 employees. We actually evolved from being a municipal water utility and, uh, and in 1996 became EPCOR. Um, I'm old enough to have lived through that. So I'm not gonna tell you how old, but uh, I have worked for EPCOR for 40 years. So um, I've worked in water and wastewater for a very long time. So it's something that, uh, that I really love. And um, this is a very exciting project for us. Um, so since, uh, you know, since that time, since 1996, EPCOR has, uh, has actually gone outside our original uh, city boundaries and we've invested in water, wastewater, uh, gas, electric utilities, um, and we've entered into fixed price contracts to design and construct and, uh, and operate facilities for various other communities. Um, so when we were chosen, um, we had to put a team together uh, that would do the entire scope that was necessary here. And that means uh, add uh, a designer, uh, a constructor uh, to the team, as well as um, uh, we would be the operator and, and the financier. So that's kind of uh, the roles that, uh, that we bring. Um, so we, we do bring... Um, I guess EPCOR operates across three, three states, mainly in the United States. Uh, as you can see, many communities, um, we own a lot of different uh, utilities and operate those utilities. Um, so we bring that experience now to Lake Oswego. Um, and again, since 1996, uh, EPCOR has actually uh, delivered many, many projects to many different communities and industrial customers. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've done, uh, done that through a variety of delivery models. And, and again, the one we're using um, for this project as is required, it will be a P3. So a design, build, operate, uh, finance, operate and maintain. And, uh, and as Jill mentioned, we, um, this type of contract actually keeps us on the hook. So once we get to 60% design and we, and we supply that firm fixed price, uh, we will be held to that, uh, that capital cost. We will be held to the operations cost that we put forward at that time. And if, uh, if we go over that cost, that's our problem, um, not the city of Lake Oswego's. And so what that really does is it offers um, the ability to have stable rates over that time and, and, uh, and actually be able to know uh, what those, how those rates are going to be affected. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a very strong model that a lot of communities are turning to. And uh, so, so EPCOR, I guess, uh, just to wrap it up, has that financial strength to actually stand behind those projects and, uh, and deliver on them. That's what we intend to do here. Um, so, when the RFP came out and the city uh, outlined its um, requirements for the project, well, some of these we've already talked about, a lot of them we talked about, but uh, one of the, the number one thing was it has to be affordable for pay rate, for rate payers. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it has to be able to meet the, uh, the new permit um, and the new permit requirements, which are gonna be more stringent than the old permit was. 
Uh, the existing plant requires upgrades as has been stated. Uh, again, we believe that we can build a brand new plant and operate it for 30 years for uh, you know, a lower life cycle cost than that mm. would have happened if we upgraded Tryon. Um, the existing plant is located in, a, in the floodplain and let's just have a look at that. That's how it looks when the, when the river has overflowed its banks and um, you can see the plant up in the uh, right hand corner, um, kind of half underwater there. The, um, there was a question that came up uh, and it, it asked about, well, if the site is right beside the old site, isn't it prone to flooding too? And so you can see just to the left of the wastewater treatment plant, that sort of green patch there, um, there's a big white building um, with kind of a, um, a polygon shape to it. Well, that, that uh, half of that property is underwater as well. And so one of the requirements uh, that we have to fulfill is we have to be able to keep all of the critical components of the new wastewater treatment plant above the one in 500 year flood level. And so, uh, so we're gonna have to do some modifications to the site. We'll, we'll be doing some excavations and building up part of the site. And we'll be making sure that the critical components are above that flood level. <clears throat> the, um, the site constraints, it, it, uh, you know, just to talk about that, it is a compact site. It is only six acres. Uh, you know, there, there are not uh, a lot of technologies that can sort of fit that site uh, effectively. Um, and the other big thing about thinking about where to put a, you know, where to put a plant and why, why did we pick that site? Well, it's because all of the main um, uh, sewer um, uh, transmission comes to that location, obviously, because it comes to the existing plant. So it's pretty easy then, or easier, I shouldn't say it's easy, but it's easier to intercept the flows and to redirect those to a new plant uh, that would just be adjacent to the old plant. Um, we were uh, asked to make sure that the new plant is energy efficient. Uh, that's a big deal, um, especially with rising energy costs and, uh, and, and the fact that we want to lower our carbon footprint. Um, climate change, as was mentioned, uh, is upon us. Uh, and I think a lot of us have experienced this summer being quite a bit warmer than we ever remember. And, mm. and so, um, you know, we've got to make sure that we have a resilient plant, as Jill mentioned, uh, that can handle those, those things that are going to come our way because of climate change it's got to be sustainable. And sustainable means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But, um, you know, there are, it is our intent to incorporate whatever sustainability uh, features that we can to the plant uh, to make sure that we address those things. And lastly, Jill mentioned this quickly, um, cybersecurity has become very important where we didn't have to ever worry about that in the past. A number of utilities in the U.S. have been hit with uh, hackers who have hacked in and demanded uh, a payment to, uh, to release the operation back to them. We wanna make sure we're not one of those. So when we looked at um, what technologies could possibly fit all of those requirements, we did go through a process where we uh, you know, examined um, some of the um, most, most used technologies across North America and Europe. Um, and so we ended up uh, coming forward with a recommendation to the city that they should consider Aqua Nareda. Um, it, it is uh, one of the brand new, well, not brand new, it, it's actually been around for 20 years, but it's new to North America. And so um, there are now some plants in the United States uh, there's a full-scale plant in Alabama. There's another one just starting up in Montana. And so it's not, uh, we like to call it leading edge technology, not bleeding edge. And this is definitely not bleeding edge. So uh, this is what we have put forward as a recommendation. Um, some of the features of Aqua Nerida, and, and one of the reasons we looked at it, if you look at the first graph there, you'll see that that one illustrates footprint. It compares some of the most uh, widely used uh, wastewater technologies. And you can see that uh, as far as footprint goes, Aqua Narita is right up there with the, the best of the footprints. It's 25% of what uh, a total biological nutrient removal plant on the far left 
of what that would use for land. So it kind of fit the bill there. Then next, we looked at energy usage. And, uh, and as you can see, the only competitor in terms of footprint, um, well, it gets blown away in terms of energy usage and uh, the comparison between the two. So again, these, these things and other, when we um, really looked into Aqua Narita, uh, you know, drove us to uh, present this option to Lake Oswego. So some of the key advantages, it can fit into that small site we talked about. Um, very much smaller carbon footprint. Um, so the technology itself is, um, is a little different. The biology is what makes it, is, is kind of the secret. Um, so all of the um, uh, attributes of waste, wastewater uh, that have to be removed, um, uh, especially nutrient removal now in newer permits, uh, can be done in one basin. And, uh, and because the sludge is heavier than typical sludge, uh, it, it settles very much more quickly, which means that your basin sizes are smaller. So what that really uh, leads us to is that uh, we use uh, smaller basins, less concrete, uh, and so we actually are able to establish a smaller carbon footprint, both to construct the plant and then to operate it. Um, and the operation is, is much less because there is less mechanical equipment. The, the, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, Jay mentioned uh, lots of uh, oxygen used in wastewater treatment. Uh, we use um, less oxygen because the basins are smaller, less blowers, less pumps. There's less piping, uh, and so it's very much um, uh, an, an efficient type plant uh, because there's all that less equipment. The energy usage is way less uh, than a typical plant. And one of the really nice things is a simple operation, so it requires less staff. You don't have to have a staff of 10 on site to run one of these plants. Um, it's going to be a lot less than that. Uh, it really can produce high quality effluent, which we expect is going to be necessary uh, to satisfy the new permit. So we're, in summary, we're just happy to be uh, here and, and hopefully part of Lake Oswego's wastewater future. So Duke, uh, our question came up from Duke and Jennifer Castle. How uh, seismically stable is this site and will the plant be used immediately following uh, Cascadia subductions uh, earthquake? Uh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, sorry. I didn't. So the question is, this area is uh, seismically active. Oh, We're supposed yes. to have a Cascadia event. And uh, if we get that uh, subduction zone, big earthquake, how safe will the new plant be and will it be usable? So can we still flush after an earthquake? <laughs> so so the plant will be designed to um, uh, to the seismic requirements that are uh, that are set out for this area. Um, so we do expect that, you know, because we're doing that, uh, the plant will be able to withstand that sort of um, uh, occurrence. Mm -hmm. uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, no, we have to we have to design it to those seismic requirements, Jay. Yeah. And, you know, a question for me that uh, I was involved with a large MBR plant up in Calgary, down in Calgary in your case. <laughs> and uh, it would, would impress me in that plant. I mean, it was beautiful plant to look at, but it had a large, a uh, lot of air turbines and a lot of horsepower running those air turbines. And so it sounds like the Aqua Nevera uh, technology doesn't rely on a lot of additional uh, aeration to the system. Yeah, I mean, it's the same concept. Um, typically, any wastewater plant will, that's the key to being able to, you know, to treat, um, is to, you, you uh, add the air to create the right bi biology and the right microbiology in your wastewater treatment plant. Um, so it's not eliminated, Jay, but because the basins are that much smaller, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a lot less than it would be. Right. Um, and then uh, my friend Buzz uh, has a question, how much of the city is going to be served by the new plant? Uh, his understanding a large portion of the city wastewater actually goes to the Tigard facility near Durham. And if this is correct, will the new plant design bring all of LO's waste treatment in-house? Yeah, let me take a shot at that one. Sure. Uh, so uh, about uh, about thirteen percent of the city uh, of of customers are served by the Durham plant. Uh, so eighty seven percent is served by wow. um, the Trine Creek. So um, and so um, no, there isn't there isn't a plan to bring those those thirteen percent in. Uh, it, it once again it comes down to um, you know. Um, 
the, the thirty percent are on the left upper side, mostly of the, of the, of the city, and uh, uh, and and also how the infrastructure. I mean, uh, if once again um, uh, the pipes flow downhill so uh so uh, it's all grab you know it's gravity so it's that's the lowest point for it to go to uh, of that other otherwise you need pump stations a bunch, and a bunch of other infrastructure and uh and once again uh, the, the, germ, the germ plant is doing fine as far as serving that so that's that's not that's not within the scope of this project yeah all right a couple more questions uh does your firm have experience with either technologies that you described methane capture or the use of fog uh, in the to help uh juice up the plant Actually, we do. Um, we, ha we have a lot of experience with, uh, with a lot of the elements of net zero wastewater treatment plants. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jay up in Edmonton, we actually send um, about uh, four and a half million gallons a day of reclaimed water to a refinery that's mm -hmm. uh, very close to us on the river. So we, we, are, uh, we do understand that business. Um, as far as um, methane capture, we're actually uh, doing a project at our wastewater treatment plant in Edmonton now to, uh, to capture all the biogas uh, and in to, to install a, a system that will create renewable natural gas to inject it into the pipeline and, uh, and, and sell it to California, uh, <laughs> notionally. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, yeah, so we do have uh, experience with that. Um, the, um, the use of fog, uh, you, you actually add fats, oils, and greases to your anaerobic digester. They uh, digest very well um, with, uh, with wastewater sludge. There's been a lot of combining of uh, actually food waste and uh, fog with uh, wastewater um, biosolids. Um, and so we have been involved in those types of projects. And uh, again, again, understand that technology. Um, you know, we're going to be looking at all the opportunities uh, that we can apply to the city of Lake Oswego's new wastewater treatment plant. Um, of course, we're, you know, we're going to um, weigh off the financial benefits of, of doing so. Uh, you know, sometimes some of these technologies, if, if there's not enough uh, scale to your plant, and, that, and the wastewater plant at Lake Oswego won't be uh, a, a huge plant like Portland, but if there's not enough scale, it's hard to make it pay for itself. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be looking at all those things and we'll doing, be doing financial analysis uh, along with technical analysis to see which might apply to the site. And kind of a, a uh, me, that, so that question coming in, um, Anthony, do you have a yeah, you, yeah. Before we, we go on to that, I think this this is a very important thing that I just want to touch on a little bit. So uh, the scale thing is a, is a is a big thing. So like for example, uh, uh, we just were at the Columbia plant today, uh, taking a look at it, at it, and it's seventy two acres is the overall property of that. And once again, we're talking six acres for our property, um, uh, and then uh, the 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 Gresham plant is twenty three acres. Uh, once again, we're talking six acres for ours. Uh, the scale is just so much different. And and once again, when you start talking about net zero and things like that, uh, the scale matters a lot uh, for, for that type of thing. And, and so, um, uh, and when, when Gresham did the net zero, they were the second one in the US to do net zero. So it's very uncommon to actually achieve that. And you actually need a scale in order to achieve those, those things. And, and um, uh, unfortunately, one of the big constraints here is that Lake Oswego property is not only very expensive, but all already built. Um, and, uh, and so uh, it's, it, it's the most challenging part of this project is to be able to find land that we can actually build on and, and use. And, and so um, I think these are all really, these are really interesting things. And I think, I think there's variations of things that we can look at. So like, mm -hmm. when we talk about reclamation, a water reclamation project, it's not feasible to do one for the whole city as far as doing irrigation, but maybe we can look at doing uh, uh, water reclamation irrigation for foothills and maybe even uh, for George Rogers. Uh, those are things that we're going to, we're going to look at and analyze on whether we can we can pull that off or not and and irrigate uh, those using uh, you know reclaimed water for for from our plant so I, th I think there's versions of this that we can look at it's just once again this, this, the scale is is a really big deal when it comes to a, lo a lot of these uh, especially when it comes down to biosolid treatments where you get a lot of sustainability uh, a mileage out of it's just um, the bigger the plant the more opportunity you really have truly you know yeah, yeah exactly right, Anthony. And, and one thing, sorry, Jay, just to yeah, add, yeah. one of the first things you, you do when you, um, 
when you're looking at, uh, is it worth it to do methane capture and, and uh, use that as a reusable product? You do a biomethane production potential. Uh, and so if you, if you do that and you do it on a very small plant, you're typically not going to have enough biogas to actually be able to make that to happen. But it doesn't mean we'll ignore it. We're, we're going to look at that, um, you know, and, and we'll make a thoughtful decision on that. But as Anthony says, we do have some, you know, some restrictions and some things to work within. And the castles kind of had a, I don't know, modify their question a little bit along the same lines, looking at net zero carbon by 2050. And so how do I modify that? Uh, you know, are we going to have the capability of if there's new technology that comes down, some smart engineer somewhere, says, hallelujah, I've invented the miracle piece that goes in there. Is the plant going to be designed so it can be upgraded in the future to get closer to net zero? We, we've had a good discussion about that. Um you know, with Lake Oswego, I think what we want to consider in our design is the ability uh, to be flexible. Mm -hmm. um, again, um, the, the site itself is not, uh, not a site where we have a lot of room to expand, but um, typically a lot of these technologies are ideas that work within an existing footprint, but just make better use of it. So, you know, we'll be looking, we'll be looking to um, make it flexible enough to be able to add those things in future, uh, should that happen. I mean, uh, you know, with solar panels, one of the things about solar power um, is that they take a lot of space, they take a lot of room, um, you know, and so all of those things will be considerations. Uh, I, I do want to say that, um, you know, the um, the original installation of mm. this technology will already be a, a huge energy saver. Um, and so, you know, we'll be looking at, say, um, 50 or 60 percent of the energy of uh, what a typical plant or what a different technology would use. So I think, you know, we're looking at it right off the hop. How can we get it down as low as it can be? But certainly, if there are opportunities, you know, by 2050 to add new technologies, you know, that we'll be looking at that. Yeah. I'm Sorry, Jay, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you go right ahead. I just have two, two thoughts to add to it. Uh, so first is uh, to, to um, Lee's comment about um, solar panels taking a lot of space. Uh, the Gresham's plant took up one and a quarter acres for their solar panels that they took. Uh, that's, that's how much space it took for them to have their solar panels uh, that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that we can't have solar panels. It's just, once again, to strain site, we have to make choices uh, in order to how that would work uh, with that. Uh, and we, it just has to be analyzed if, if it's feasible or not. And what scale. Um, and the uh, uh, second part um, is that um, um, I, I think it, one thing that one thing that's going to be interesting in this project that we haven't discussed yet is that we're going to try to disguise it to look like a commercial um, plant, mm -hmm. so that it's not going to look like a plant. It's going to look like a facility. So when you walk by it, it's going to it's it's going to fit into Lake Oswego's uh, um, look uh, so much better than our current plant. And also, as far as smell mitigation, all that stuff too, it's going to be uh, it's going to be very significant difference between what we have in our plant now. So uh, once again, I think we're trying to figure out if we can put everything that we are going to do inside actual buildings. So when you you walk by you're not going to be able to see that it's a facility a plant at all so i think it's just an interesting thing that i haven't mentioned yet but it's something that we're we're working on too so please uh yep. yeah and i know up in, in vancouver and we've talked about this past anthony that the the columbia oh, i forget what they call it but the uh, the new wastewater treatment plant up there that was designed by siege tom hill uh, the problem they have is people think it's a shopping center and they keep on driving in and <laughs> looking for uh, new clothes there so with a little bit different kind of shopping <laughs> oh, oh, one, one more thing to uh, to mention to your question, Jay. Um, mm -hmm. um, so we will ha we will have a choice uh, after we demo demo and remediate the existing plant uh, on whether or not we want to carve off a piece of that for a future expansion or for to have a little bit of more build out. But the, the but the timing of that is so far down the road. I mean, by the yeah. time that we actually remediate, I mean we're talking um, we're going to hopefully have the plant built and operated and uh, by the end of. 2024, early 2025, uh, 
uh, and then the remediation, all that is going to take, you know, a design and or a, a process in order to, mm -hmm. to do that effectively, especially the remediation part too. So that's another year, possibly more. So, and then, then you'd have to actually build something. So, uh, you know, we're talking 2026, 2027 before you can have something um, using more, uh, you know, carving off a piece of that, uh, that's, that's that. Cause we, ha we have to uh, operate our current plant while we're building it and actually in tandem and, um, and and one thing that's really advantageous about using this site next door is that we we hope to be able to use the existing outfall uh, uh, that uh, as was mentioned before um, um, uh, uh, is actually in really good shape and and uh, we're, we're we're very uh, fortunate to have that as as an option so yeah that's good and I I see uh, Diane's uh, question about methane same kind of thing where it sounds like your plant's going to be designed so if Technology and costs come down uh, and methane capture, you're going to have the ability to look at that in the future and, and weigh it's whether it's viable or not. Yeah, nothing we're going to do today would preclude that if, say, you know, something were to change. And like Anthony says, you know, we were to carve off a piece of land and decide we wanted to do that. Nothing would that we do today would preclude that. That's good. Um, you know, and are there any more questions out there? Looks like D Diane Carlson has one. I can try that was, that. Oh yeah, right there. Remediation. Uh, does the current proper? What remediation does the current property need? Can the land be added to the park? Yeah, so uh, we, we don't know we don't know what level of remediation is needed yet. Uh, that's something that we've tasked EPCOR to do a project uh, on and, and actually take a look at. And that's uh, going to be done uh, towards um, once again where we still have eleven months left on this uh, preliminary services period. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that will be done uh, uh, next year. Um, and um, um, the second part of that question is: uh, Can land be added to the park? I mean, that is a that, that is a discussion that needs to occur um, um, uh, of what its potential that it could become um, some kind of uh, natural space. But uh, that's, that's a discussion that has not occurred yet, and would need to occur with the council. Yeah, yeah. And make sure if any of you have questions, well. While you guys think about your great questions, um, you know some of the things that I really heard that are kind of exciting or innovative about this is this is a private public process, which is different. You know, for different for uh, all of us uh, ratepayers to see here, it's not like the new wastewater plant or the floating intercept or the floater, floating sewer line. Um, and I was really impressed that you know, you're looking at a you know capping the rate increase to a three percent rate increase per year, which roughly is about inflation. Um, which, you know, for the, for the fixed and uh, lower income uh, residents of Lake Oswego, which we often forget about, that, that is a huge plus for it. Um, the uh, life cycle, uh, uh, you know, and the energy, or the energy use when we're looking at uh, the uh, uh, scope one and, you know, energy use out of that, the electrical use, wow. A lot less, you know, MBR would be the other plant that would fit there, but this is what 25% of that electrical use. And, and that's huge, you know, both in carbon output and cost. Um, and I think we're all going to be excited to uh, see the 15% design come out this fall. And then uh, next year, uh, end of next summer, it sounds like the city council will have some good, hard decisions to make. Uh, Pretty, pretty good summary. Jay, uh, if, if I can, Jay, if I can just say something, and maybe yeah, Lee, sure. you, you can correct me. Um, but I think in addition to the energy savings, there's also a really an important component of this, which is that the um, aqua narrative process uses much less chemicals. Um, so, so if we're minimizing our footprint, it shouldn't only be about energy, right? It's got to be about all, all things that are bad. Okay. So I don't know, Lee, if you want to add something um, or if I've said it all there. Yeah, no. Uh Actually, if you compare MBRJ and, and you compare it to Aqua Narita, um, the part that MBR needs some help with sometimes is phosphorus removal, yep. where you're adding uh, aluminum phosphate and you're, you're adding a chemical so that you can precipitate out the uh, phosphorus. Uh, with Aqua Narita, um, the biological process that you cultivate within that basin uh, at the levels we're talking about now that we've looked at the phosphorus uh, coming into the plant, um, should require no chemical at all. And we'll be able to remove that totally. 
So the only chemical that would be used is in a, in, in a very innocuous chemical. Uh, it would be added to the solids to thicken them up, uh, and uh, and that would be it. Yeah, because I know MBR plants, uh, you have to treat the uh, the filter media with some pretty nasty uh, chemicals, and it's uh, otherwise you run into trouble and lose your filters. So it's you're you're right. The maintenance of the membranes, uh, yes. Acetic acid and uh, and then uh, chlorine uh, is used to to clean the membranes at various intervals, and then every seven years or so, you actually have to replace the membranes at a cost of you know four or five or six hundred thousand uh, dollars every seven years. So yeah. with aquanarita, that doesn't exist. And so, um, question came in from uh, Diane. Uh, does the city uh, have a projection of what the city population is going to be in 30 years and how much room for growth is built into the new plant? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, uh, so um, actually, <laughs> we just spent a lot of time uh, double checking everything we had in our RFP mm -hmm. uh, uh, with with this actually in mind. And uh, 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 fortunately, um, uh, with us going through the whole process again, we landed exactly where we started, which was a good double check. Uh, so yes, we do have uh, we we do have uh, future projections that we've used from a variety of sources, and also um, you know, uh, and also um, uh, taking a look at what. Um, developments could be done in the future um so so yes there is uh, to give you an exact number amount of growth um I, I i don't have the model in front of me to be able to tell you that but i can tell you that 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 work has definitely been done and been double checked mm -hmm. and done and done in some uh, very very um significant detail yeah so i think also the question came in what neighborhoods in the city are not in the new plan zone so it sounds kind of like the river grove corner up there uh goes to the durham plant yeah, so I luckily have actually a um, Andy, Andy map. A map, yeah. So I just I just put it on the screen. I think. Can you see yep. it? Yeah. Sure so so uh, basically, it's it's the one that's in the you know not the green, uh, the um, the brown in the upper left corner is wow. all going to uh, um, the clean water services facility in Durham. Yeah. So that's kind of the south, little north of the Southwood in that area there. Yeah, all right. that's right. Good. So it's, it is a small percentage of the overall uh, city, yeah. So any other great questions out there? And it's, we'll give them a few seconds to think of a good question, but you know, again, I, I wanna thank uh, Anthony and uh, your team. Um, uh, you've been very open in the process and uh, it's, it's really neat to see, and uh, I'm I'm sure as they get going in um, that uh, city citizen involvement will be forefront of it. Um, I see Katie getting all excited there, you know, getting all, all of us involved in the process, and so we look forward to that. And I also, you know, um, when really want to thank Patty. You did a good job with uh, with uh, we all poo, and it all flows downhill. And so it's uh, thank you for that overview and uh, your expertise in that. Um, and Mr. And our good friend Jeff, uh, terrific panel presentation night plus great questions. Thank you and thank you, Jeff. Uh, and uh, so I think it's an exciting pro for those that, that are in the environmental business. This is exciting. I do water plant, and for the rest of you, thank you for attending tonight. That uh, it's new. It's normally not a subject that uh, you probably don't go touring the wastewater plants, which are very interesting to go to <laughs> and uh, you know, in the process. So encourage you to be involved and in the process and uh, that's what makes our city great. Jay, we could talk for hours. I'm excited I too. Know. <laughs> well, when you're down here, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> we'll contribute to the plant. <laughs> yes, that's a very important process. <laughs> And thank you, especially to Jill, who is up very late to do yeah. this with us. We really appreciate your being here. Um, well, I think if we're closing off, I just wanted to let everybody know that our next monthly forum will be held on September 23rd at 6.30. Um, that's a week later than normal, but it's we wanna have a, a forum that's covering um, frequently asked questions about electric vehicles. And if you're interested in buying an electric vehicle or you have questions on that, um, this is the forum to come to. And also we'd like to ask you to join us for our, sun, our September monthly social 
hour at five o'clock. Um, in September, we are meeting at Babi Kahen on Moons Ferry Road. Um, please come meet and mingle with your sustainability friends and neighbors. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. Yes. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you for thank, having thank us. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Yeah, Have this is great. Thanks. Bye-bye.